Good morning. I'm David Somerville, the minister at Holcomb Brook Methodist Church and Seedfield Methodist Church in Bury. Whatever the time of day is with you and wherever you are, please know that you are most welcome as you join us today. Our service this morning is led by Hazel Brooks and Simona and Lydia Yohan bring us our readings. Mary Vale tells us about having to step out of her comfort zone. Today we're looking at what limits our faith and how much more there is beyond the limits of our imagination. And now Hazel will bring us our call to worship. Thank you, David. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 145, one of today's lectionary readings, and it speaks so much to us of the greatness and the goodness of God. And so we worship as I read. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. Amen. And so the music will lead us as we sing, very much reflecting those words, the splendor of the King, robed in majesty. How great is our God.
Let's pray. Lord, we come together to worship you today, to speak of your greatness, to stand in awe as we see your glory, mighty God. And we see reflections of your glory in the splendour of your creation, all pointing to your greatness. And as we see the majesty of the mountains and the lakes, the woods and the streams, we can't help but sing of your greatness and your majesty, our resplendent King. How great is our God. But Father, we recognise how much we fall short of your holiness and we come to say we're sorry. Sorry for all the times we let you down in the things we do and say and think and the times when we fail to act in response to your prompting. Let's take a moment in quietness to confess our sins. And Father, we thank you for the forgiveness you promise for each one of us when we are truly sorry and repent and turn to you. Amen. And we continue in prayer in the words Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Two weeks ago, I shared something of my story of my time in Romania. On my first solo trip, I met Nina and her five children, and that whole family have been such an important part of my life ever since. When we first met in 1997, Simona was 12 and Lydia was nine. They are, of course, much older now and they have both been working in Berry for several years, but now very much feel it's time to go home and that's where God is calling them. And so before they leave, actually just tomorrow to go home to Yash, they're going to bring us our Bible readings for today. Thank you. Today's reading is from Ephesians chapter three from verse 14 until verse 21. From this reason I need before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and low, how high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know, his, to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measurable of all the fulfillment of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within you, us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all the generations forever and ever. Amen. Today's reading is from John chapter 6 verses 1 to 21. Some time after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing those who, who were ill. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered me, him, It would take more than half of year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. 
Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciple, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign, before, signs before, sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come in the world, into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. When, when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across to the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water and they were frightened but he said to them it is i don't be afraid then they were willing to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading amen let us pray may the written word through the spoken word lead us to an encounter with the risen eternal word, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul writes, Now to him who is able to do far more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. How is your imagination? How far-fetched can you imagine life? How fixed are you in your thinking? Can you think outside the box or even is there a box? When you have been doing things one way for a long time, you can forget that there are other options. The deadliest words are, we don't do that here, or We've never done that before. One of the most precious gifts that God has given us is our imagination. Many of the great advances in technology have been because someone imagined something that didn't exist and set out to make it a reality. I wonder if you went back to the original series of Star Trek how many of the seemingly impossible ideas in that series are now commonplace? I remember Lieutenant Uhura with a communications device sticking out of her ear. We've had that and gone beyond with Bluetooth. Do you remember Captain Kirk flipping open his communications device long before mobile phones that flipped open were invented? Or doors that opened by themselves before every supermarket had them? Someone in writing that series sat down and imagined what life would be like. And so many of those science fiction things have become science fact. It's not limited to science fiction. The Apostle Paul imagined everyone in the Roman Empire hearing the gospel, when many of the other apostles had not stepped outside Jerusalem. Marcus Rashford, in looking at solving child hunger, instead of asking why, asked, why not? Some of the great social transformers in British history saw beyond the norms and the traditions of their day. William Wilberforce imagined a world without slavery, while others could not see beyond their own personal loss if slavery were abolished. Elizabeth Fry imagined a world where prison conditions were changed from the intolerable conditions that existed. John Wesley imagined a world where the gospel could reach the ordinary man and woman, irrespective of their social status 
or their relationship with the national church. The thing is, no matter how great these people's imagination was, there is someone who can imagine more. Not only imagine, but also put into effect. That person is God. In our Gospel reading we come across two miracles. We call them miracles because they are beyond our understanding, beyond our imagination. They were beyond the imagination of the disciples. Faced with a large hungry crowd, armed only with five loaves and two fish, they could not imagine being able to feed them. Needing a boat to get across water, they could not imagine anyone walking on water. Jesus wasn't phased by either problem. He asked the disciples to get the people sat down and set to work with what he had. Mathematics in the Kingdom of God is a strange affair. Somehow five loaves and two fish feed 5,000 with 12 baskets of scraps left over. Somehow the surface tension in the water supports Jesus' weight. To you and to me, they are impossible. They don't make sense. It's why we call them miracles. Paul tells us that God is able to do more than we can ask or imagine. If you can't imagine it, then you can't ask for it. The writer to the Hebrews in chapter 11 states, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's Hebrews 11 verse 1. A couple of weeks ago I mentioned about Jesus forcing the disciples out of their comfort zone by sending them out with practically nothing, relying on God's provision and help from others. We would argue it utterly foolhardy and yet the results were beyond anything they had seen in mission. When I was talking at Open Door and Zoom, I spoke about this and was reminded of the eagle mother that pushes its fledgling chicks to the edge of the nest so that they will fly. The safest place is the centre of the nest, but no bird will learn to fly unless it approaches the edge of the nest. What if the edge that we are so afraid of is nowhere near the real edge? It's just beyond the edge of where we've been. As Frodo Baggins and Samwise Gamgee set off from the Shire in the first of the Lord of the Rings films, Samwise stops suddenly. If I take one more step, it will be the farthest from home I have ever been. He was, discover, he was to discover how much more there was to Middle Earth. Sometimes we stop and say, this is the farthest I have ever been. If I go any further, I'll be in uncharted territory. Paul's response is a prayer. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. I wonder whether we stumble about in the foothills of God's love and never venture to the peaks. We settle for too little, accepting that the ordinary is all there is, and never venturing further. As Frodo and Sam head towards Mordor, their fellow hobbits stayed within the confines of the Shire, blissfully unaware of what was beyond. Yes, there was great evil, but there were also great good and great love that they would never know. It seems to me in what God has been saying to me in preparing for the last few sermons that God is saying there is so much more, if only we would trust. There's more than we can do, if only we would step out of our comfort zone. I remember a cartoon which had a circle in the bottom left-hand corner, down here, and in the top right-hand corner was an arrow pointing to where stuff happens. There's a great prayer by Dr. S. M. Lockridge, now gone to glory, entitled, That's My King. He proclaims in a style that I cannot emulate, 
about how supreme over everything and everyone Jesus is, declaring, that's my king. If you have access to the internet, look it up. It's well worth a listen. But one stanza caught my attention. He says, David says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. No means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. No barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. We continually underestimate God's love and provision for us. Because we have experienced seemingly unanswered prayer, we decide it's better not to pray or not to ask. Ask for a little and you won't be disappointed. But what if we did ask big? What if we accepted that we may not get everything but ask nonetheless? What if we step out in faith, uncertain if that faith will be realised, but stepping out anyway? I remember organising a service of prayer for healing at a church. Most of the members of that church stayed away. It was safer to avoid disappointment than it was to take the risk of stepping out in faith. Almost 70 years ago, J.B. Phillips wrote a book entitled, Your God is Too Small. I fear that we are willing to settle for a tame, toothless God of whom we expect very little and therefore receive very little. I fear that we ask Marcus Rashford's question, why not, and then come up with a whole raft of reasons. I fear that rather than being the church that shakes the very gates of hell, we settle for theological discussions on whether hell exists. Next week I start on a three-month sabbatical. I don't know what God has in mind for me during those three months, but if what I've been discerning from our Bible readings is right, there's a need for us to be braver in our faith, to step out not knowing where our foot is going to land, Expect big things from God, and if they don't come at once, recognise that the waiting and the discipline of waiting is part of the process of transformation. John Wesley said of the Methodist people, I'm not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist either in Europe or America. But I am afraid, lest they should only exist as a dead sect having the form of religion without the power. If we settle for safety, if we stay within our comfort zone, we gradually die. The challenge for us is to be willing to live on the edge, to step out in faith, not knowing where it will lead us other than we go where God is. If you want to sum this up in the words of Jesus, you can do no better than going to Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 26. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? They're challenging words, but they're words for today that tell us that what we think of as safe isn't safe. And as we step out in faith, God will be with us. If the love of God is so vast compared to our limited experience, what would allow us to step out into it? Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. May it be so. In Jesus' name. Amen.
thank you David for your word and now Mary is going to share with us a time when she was bold and stepped out of her comfort zone and found that God was faithful and with her. Thank you Mary. It was uh, sometime in March, April 2019 that Ramsbottom Churches Together held a campaign in Ramsbottom called Hashtag Do You Know Him? Him of course being Jesus and it was held over the Lent period and churches held various events in their own premises to which we could invite people, friends and neighbours but also on Saturday morning uh, we were asked to go out and chat to the people in Ramsbottom um, perhaps introducing them to Jesus for the first time or just chatting to them about Jesus and praying with people if they needed it I felt that I, I should go, but telling myself, that's not what you do, Mary. Uh, you just don't do that sort of thing. So I didn't volunteer, but I just felt that I really should. So eventually I asked if it would be all right if I could sit in a cafe rather than wander around because my arthritis was bad at the time and I couldn't stand for any length of time or walk too far. And I was told, yes, that's fine. So on the Saturday morning that I was going to come down and join in, I said to God, well, all right, Lord, before I get out of bed, I need to have no pain. And I need to be able to drive into Ramsbottom and find a parking space fairly near to St. Paul's Church because we always had a time of prayer when we started. And the third thing, I need someone to come and talk to me when I'm sitting with my cup of tea in a cafe. So when I got out of bed, I had no pain. So God had ticked the first box. I drove into Ramsbottom and there was plenty of space. So that was the second box ticked. I went to Bailey's, the nearest cafe to St Paul's Church sat down and ordered a cup of um, a pot of tea which always came with extra water so two or three cups of tea later there was hardly anyone in in Bailey's and nobody else came in so I decided to move on to another cafe and I moved to the lounge a little bit further away it was heaving with people and I couldn't see a spare table or a seat anywhere but two people got up, so I moved towards that vacant table as another couple moved towards it. And we arrived at the same time and agreed that we would share. I ordered a coffee, they ordered tea and tea each and a bacon muffin. When their bacon muffin came, they split it carefully into two and divided the ba bacon between them and said, we always come here on a Saturday morning and share a bacon muffin. It, we carried on chatting for a bit uh, about all sorts of things, but again they mentioned they loved the lounge, they loved Ramsbottom, so they always came on a Saturday. And that gave me the opening for me to say why I was there. So I said, well, I'm here because... And I started telling them about the campaign and how many people from various churches were wandering around Ramsbottom talking to people who would listen about Jesus, introducing them to him if they hadn't, didn't know him and just generally chatting and praying with them if they wanted prayer. And the man immediately opened up, told me about his childhood, how he'd always attended church and Sunday school but how he had dropped away. They lived in the Brandlesome area and after a while he did say, I'm going to go back to Brandlesham Church, I'm going to try it again. And we agreed that that would be a really good idea. But I was just so very thankful that, that I had done what God had nudged me to do. He had ticked all my questions, requests, and I'd stepped out in faith, trusting him, knowing that he would be with me. And I've often felt that if I step out, when I know it's him asking me to do something, he will never leave me on my own. 
but I have to step out in faith first. In our prayers for others, I invite you to pray in the silence, prompted by the words that I will say and by the images that are on the screen. So let's pray together. We pray for those who are hungry, hungry for physical food, and for the work of food banks, including porch boxes and Rami Pantry, and for those families who will struggle as the school holidays begin. We pray for those who are spiritually hungry, searching for meaning, searching for God. We pray for those fleeing persecution, looking for a new home, risking dangerous sea crossings and being exploited by people traffickers. And we pray for those suffering from the results of climate change facing extreme heat and horrendous flooding. We pray for those who just need a miracle to change their lives. And we pray for ourselves that we will be bold and step beyond our comfort zone. Let's pray over each other using those words from Ephesians. So I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. And we finish our service as the music group leading us in singing Water You Turned Into Wine our God is greater.
Thank you for being with us today. We would love to hear from you. Please contact us at bit, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash Sidfield, and we'll come back to you. Thank you. This will be my last service for a while as I will be on sabbatical for three months. I know that our worship is in the hands of a brilliant team who have brought our services to you over the last 17 months. As we move to live streamed services, we hope to unite our congregations in the building with those at home. These are exciting times. I ask for your prayers for those who will be leading our services, and I pray that you will continue to be blessed. In Jesus' name, Amen. And now a blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Here are some questions for you to consider either on your own or with others. Firstly, imagination is a wonderful thing. There's a saying that someone can be so heavenly minded that they're no earthly use. And the opposite of that is that they're so earthly minded that they're no heavenly use. How would you describe yourself? Secondly, does your worship of God help to expand your view of him or do you find your views fixed and unchanging? Thirdly, what are the boundaries of your faith? Like Samwise Gamgee in Lord of the Rings saying, this is the farthest I have come. What is beyond that boundary and what is stopping you from stepping over it? Fourthly, is it better to stay safe and avoid disappointment? Or is it better to be adventurous and discover new things? Which camp are you in? Fifthly, what is your experience of God doing things out of the ordinary? And finally, when facing a challenge, Marcus Rashford asks, why not? instead of why. If you were asked to step out in faith, what would your question be? And what would you expect as an answer? May God bless you as you consider these questions and may you know his presence in this coming week. In Jesus' name. Amen.